Right. Welcome back. I let's see. So administrative things. I posted previous slides and videos, except for the last video from Thursday, but everything else is online. Hopefully you've seen this. We have a few presentations to do um, for either Thursday or for next week, Tuesday. So if you haven't presented, especially if you haven't presented yet, to sign up for one. But if you have presented and you feel like one of these is particularly interesting, then by all means, you're welcome to present again. But especially if you haven't presented. We've been keeping tabs. Have we, Bobo? Yes, they're here. Tabs are here. We've been keeping tabs. Okay. Um, then what I'd like to do today is continue our conversation of so regression modeling, linear regression modeling in particular, tips and tricks, things that can go wrong and things that might help you when you're um, doing this for yourselves. Is there anything I can answer from last Thursday's lecture before I begin though? Can somebody remind me what we talked about on Thursday and why it was interesting? Notes the leading question. I'm implying that it was interesting. I think this was Thursday. One of the things you talked about was time bias in data, like whether it how that can like whether um, recent things haven't had their entire life happen yet. Oh yeah, there was this. There was, that's right. There was a. Uh, a trick with right censorship. Yeah. One of the things that can go wrong. That's right. I did talk about this. What else? Uh, Matt, everybody's waiting for you to uh, tell us what we were talking about on Thursday. Okay, that did not land at all. I should I should work in my humor. This is green hour. Keep waiting. <laughs> okay, never mind. I take that back. Failed failed attempt. Uh, tell me more about Thursday. Talked about. Some million dollar ideas and some billion dollar ideas, what were they? Oh, if only Sam were here to complain. What was the million or billion dollar idea? It was one of those, you know, if you remember only one thing from today's lecture, make it be this thing sort of thing. What was it? You wanna try? The million billion dollar idea. Test the, we can only test or prove uh, Prove or disprove a hypothesis, which is based on theory about something else that we are trying to learn about. Yes. We're not testing a tool, we're testing a hypothesis we have about a theory related to that tool. Yes. And how does this relate to regression? That's where I want to go. Regression can help us prove or disprove that hypothesis? Can help us test the hypothesis, yes. Thank you, why Why does it help us do that? We learned about uh, ways of testing multiple factors. Uh, <laughs> you showed us a way that we can isolate the effect that was of it. different factors in a phenomenon. That was it, that was the billion dollar idea that this multiple regression framework, be it linear or otherwise, is a useful tool for you to test hypotheses about a specific variable while controlling for the effects of other variables that you've measured and included in your model. It's a really powerful idea. That was the million dollar idea. But that's why essentially everything that people do with the quantitative data analysis is based off of fundamentally that idea of you know, hypothesis testing with some statistical tests uh, and 
uh, not a true experiment because it's hard to experiment with randomized control idea, some fundamental idea somewhere of sort of hypothesis testing using statistical tests uh, to test hypotheses while effects of other Okay, so this line of thought field tricks and tricks. Remember this example I'm on I messed something up. Is there still audio? Is there audio? Yeah, we, we can hear you now. Okay, I have no idea what happened. Sorry about this. Um, and you can see the screen, hopefully, yes? Yeah, we can see the screen. Wait, no, no, we can't. Okay, thank you. That's good. I mean, it's bad, but it's good to know. <laughs> Maybe my Zoom crashed or something. Okay, how about now? Yeah, we can see it now. All right, thank you, Courtney. Um, so I showed you this example and it was presumably famous for some reason. What was the reason? Or what was interesting about this example? Does anybody remember the example at all? These are four data sets that have some interesting property. What is the property? Error. I'm old, uh, Matt. Error. Error is the property. How so? Well, in some cases, the linear regression, um, the error is um, calculated every each time. There's Obviously, it's a, it's a poor fit for the upper right, and then there's a better fit on the lower left. Um, and especially in the lower left, the air all seems to be in one, one direction. Right. Right. So I showed you this example uh, because so the, the property that these four data sets share is that although they are, you would probably agree, qualitatively very different, the orange points between the four data sets. The, they all, all four have exactly the same linear regression line. Um, and the point was that if all you do is build a model to say summarize some data that you've collected and directly interpret that model summary without further inspection of the, on the validity of said model, you can easily be misled. So you know, here in this example, you know, arguably there are three, three of the four instances you would be misled because the model you have estimated, which is the blue regression line, is a terrible fit, arguably, for, uh, or a terrible representation summary of the data that you've collected, which is the, the orange dots there. Okay? So probably the first one on the top left is a reasonable approximation, reasonable summary of the data, but the other three are not. And we talked about how you might diagnose this. What did we say about that? There's a bunch of plots. Yes. Thanks, Elijah. Luke, did you have more? I was just going to say you can look at the residuals as well and see if there's a pattern. Yes. So there's a bunch of these diagnostic plots that one could look at to inspect this. So here is here are all four side by side. I'm showing them to you again, just so you get a uh, you know kind of an overview of what was going on. This is a plot of residual values versus fitted values. Residuals is whatever's left over, okay, the error. Fitted is whatever your model estimated. So note how uh, you know already this one plot would help you tell that 
uh, you know, all the, the three models that we hate are, uh, you know, indeed clearly bad, right? Because you would want to have this, you know, uh, randomly distributed uh, residuals around this horizontal line, uh, ideally. Okay, for linear regression, that's one of the assumptions. Okay. Uh, and this, you could tell by just looking at this one set of plots that the other three models are bad. We also looked at a couple more uh, models. Um, I'm gonna share this uh, notebook with you so you can sort of study this in more depth. Let's see, do we have them side by side? Yes, we do. So this is, uh, Another one of these plots, the so-called QQ plot. Uh, here, you're looking for these uh, residuals, standardized residuals to be distributed along this diagonal line. And you could tell uh, that in some cases, they are more or less doing that, emphasis on less. And finally, there's a scale versus location set of plots where, you know, again, you're looking for this uh, random uniform uh, random cloud of uh, residuals. Um, and you could see how when there's patterns, this is a sign that something is going wrong. Uh, and it's a, an indicator for you to look further into um, the validity of the model you've constructed. Uh, yep. What are the X values supposed to be in this residual plot? Uh, the X values are the fitted values in this case. Um, and the Y value is whatever the standardized sure. Sure. residual is. Yeah. Yeah. And you want them to be more or less random and nicely spread on both sides of this horizontal line, kind of like the first one, just the residual plot. Um, the same for residuals versus leverage. This was a way to identify these high leverage outliers. We talked about two kinds of outliers. We talked about harmless outliers and we talked about nasty outliers. Does anybody remember what the distinction was? I mean, one example was that plot where you had all the points stacked up and then one point up in the top right corner. Yeah, so let me go back to this. Yeah. So the, 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 the two plots on the bottom here, does my thing work? Yay, nice. So this uh, plot on the bottom left, you see one outlier point over there. And okay? this is more of the harmless type. It's not entirely harmless, but it's more of the harmless type. This one on the right hand side is entirely nasty because. Um, you know, if you were to remove it, the regression line would change drastically here. You would get a perfect vertical if you do that. You now, with the one on the bottom left, if you remove it, you would get a regression line that goes to the orange points, which is closer to the one that was estimated. But still, the one that was estimated is still bad, but it'd be closer to the ideal one. Okay. Uh, you know, I could make this example to be more artificial by, say, taking this orange point and moving it on, you know, the extension of this regression line somewhere there. Um, and the regression line could, would change not at all, right, if I were to remove the outlier point. So that would be an entirely harmless outlier, as opposed to a nasty outlier, this one here. Okay, so these are things that you should look into. And this last plot in the series of plots on residuals versus leverage would help you identify these points uh, because often you won't be able to plot your data in a way that would you know, directly visually allow you to do this so you're using these diagnostics to help you pinpoint these points um, that need further inspection perhaps you need to eliminate them or whatnot perhaps there was an error in how you collected the data the point is you have to inspect this to figure out what was going on okay so this was the story of diagnostics. Um, and then Sam is back, excellent. Uh, so we wanna talk about, uh, talk about multicollinearity. So let's see, uh, and I 
do I have? Let me see. So Sam, I gave you a homework to tell us something about, do we have this? Where do I have this? There we go. Okay, so let me make this bigger. Oops. I gave you this example. There, I gave you this example of two, of three variables, two X's and a Y. Um, and here, the X's, the X1 and X2 are identical. You know, X2 is a copy of X1. And Y, the outcome, is simply the sum of the two variables. Okay. I gave you this example in class. Um, Sam says he did not do the homework. Okay, that's okay, Sam. We'll forgive you. Um, remember this example? We talked about it a little bit. What was the idea? Why was this interesting? Luke. If one variable is identical to another, then you might have a lot of different um, models that could be a variable. So then your coefficients become much less. Right. So um, you could see how, you know, in your attempt to estimate these beta coefficients, if you have, say, a regression y equals beta 1x1 plus beta 2x2, and that attempt to estimate these regression coefficients. It'd be really hard to do that because there are basically infinitely many combinations okay, of those uh, of these two variables that would result in the same perfect fit when it comes to estimating y. So you could have say y equals x1 plus x2. You could have y equals two times x1 plus zero times x2. That would give you exactly the same thing. You know, could have three times x1 minus one x2, et cetera. You could have you know, infinitely many of these and they all fit equally well. Um, so you know, it'd be really hard for the model to you know, estimate these coefficients because there are just so many of them that are all equally good, right? Um, and you know, we talked about how obviously you won't have perfectly cloned variables in, in real data that will never happen. But you'll often have variables that are highly correlated. You, know, you could have different measurements that fundamentally capture the same construct. You'll find that they're highly correlated, uh, and you know it's, it's sort of useful uh, sanity check to to decide what to do with them. Uh, typically, you remove all but one of them if they're predictors you're interested in, um, so that you can estimate a valid model. Otherwise, you can't trust. The standard errors on the coefficients, so you can't trust the coefficients themselves. And, um, and I promised I would show you an example of that. Well, I promised Sam would show you an example of this, uh, but that has not happened, has it, Sam? Um, so then I will show you an example of this. So here's what I'm going to try to do I'm going to try to uh, estimate this linear regression okay, and see what we get. Any guesses? We got an error, right? So we couldn't compute this correlation uh, matrix because the two values were actually clones of each other. Uh, and we could also not estimate the regression because they're actually you know, perfectly collinear. R uh, was smart enough to figure this out. So then uh, what I did next is I, added a little bit of noise to one of the copies. Okay, so I made X2 ever so slightly different from X1, just so I can estimate these coefficients and show you what's happening. Okay, you still with me? Okay, I'm gonna try this. And here's what we get. So we get Y, equals two times 
x1. Okay. Plus more or less zero times x2. Okay. So this is 10 to the minus 15. Okay. So it's really, really tiny. Okay. Basically zero. Uh, it's not quite zero because you know the those values were also somewhat different. They were not quite identical. So here, you know, R chose a model, right? Two times x one without any of x two. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and see how uh, right. So see how if I run this variance inflation factor, or if I compute the correlation between, I could show you that. Let's see, can I show you that? Yeah, I could show you that. Okay. So these are 99.5% correlated, the two variables. They are by construction because I, you know, artificially created them. But you could see that, and you could also see that in this various inflation factor test that we talked about. You know, it's another way of uh, finding which of these variables are highly collinear. Uh, and these numbers here should be around two or so or lower. Okay, so when you get 113 and some change, that's probably an indication that something is going wrong. And you know, you go check. Uh, and you decide to do something, you know, you decide to maybe remove one of the variables from your model or something else altogether. Okay. Certainly something, a cause for uh, concern and inspection, further inspection. That makes sense? Okay, so that was collinearity. Uh, let's talk about factors next. So how are we going to talk about factors? Where do we have them? Do we have them here? Maybe we have them here. Okay, so I want to show you. So far, we only talked about numerical variables, right? We talked about numbers and how you regress over numbers. We didn't talk about categories. That makes sense. We didn't talk about groups of things, things that are numbers. So the question is, you know, how do you regress over categories, if at all? Okay. You often have categorical variables. It could be location. It could be anything, but they're not numbers. Okay. Race, for example. And so this is a data set that shows you. Um, the uh, weight of babies at birth for uh, mothers of different ages and races. Okay, that's the data set. You have three races represented uh, black, white, and other, and you have the age of the mother at birth. Okay, so here. Uh, Oh, we cannot. Okay. Okay. So, um, this is a model that tries to estimates the weight at birth as a function of race and the mother's age, okay? And you've seen that race is a category, something, you know, the string, if you will, has three possible values in this data set, okay? So uh, here's what the output of that might look like. And I make this even bigger so you can see. Let's see. Yes, I can. Okay. So you've done this, and this is what you get from R. How do you read this?
read this out to me. Courtney. Um, did you want the estimate or? Uh, you cut off for a second. Can you say that again, please? Sorry. Yeah. Did you want like an interpretation of the estimate? Yes, please. Can you can you read the summary? Of, you know, in, in English. Yeah. So, like each of the estimates, like for example, um, of mother's age is saying like, on average, for each like one unit increase in the age of the mother. On average, we expect the whatever the response is, the birth weight to increase by 6.28, whatever that unit is. Right, grams, Pounds. right. Grams, sorry. Yeah, right. Thanks. Cool. So that was the easy one. That's like the ones we've seen last week, right? One unit increase in the mother's age gets you this much increase in the response. Okay. What about the other ones? How do I read the other ones? And also, isn't there one missing? I thought there were three races in the data set. Like, what's going on? The indicators are based on the, like, it, it's a comparison to, like, the, it's, each of those is an increase in slope for those races. So the base slope is for the, like, whatever the race is excluded is, if that makes sense. Probably you mean level, not slope. Level, yeah. But, but yeah. yes, you're, you're getting somewhere. Like the indicator reserve. Let's all get there. What, what, what is Elijah saying? Uh, Courtney wants to try again. Or sorry, I interrupted you. You were continuing. Yeah, no, but so for the other variable, it's categorical, so it's made dummy variables for like two of the three of them. So the interpretation of that estimate is in relation to the other category, which is called the baseline um, one. So these are like in comparison. So this is like on average, like children of mothers of race other have like, you know, on average, a gram or like 80.249 grams larger than whatever the baseline one is, babies of like the baseline race. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Thanks, that was great. That's what I was trying to convey, but did not do a very good job at it. Yeah. So this is probably just more of an honor question, but I'm just like in this hypothetical, maybe races like. I guess if you have a categorical value that's numerical and also then like, you know, like race, let's say it's just like zero, one, and two, and the mother's age, like, is there a, a way of choosing between which variable is used um, as the y axis versus just the category there? Um, say that again. Is there a way of choosing, like, how does R choose between which variable is used as the category versus? Um, sorry, the uh, x axis variable. If you make it a factor, it treats it as a categorical variable. That's my understanding. Yes. So if, if it's a numerical type, you know, an integer or a float or something, the numerical type it will treat it as a numerical variable by default. If it's a string or a factor, it will treat it as a category by default. So you have to have the type of yeah, so you know, if I were to show you, you know, the types of these variables, you would see that they are, you know, strings or factors or something like that. There's a factor type in R, oh. uh, explicitly. But so that's sort of the idea here. Yep. So uh, can you put like two zones together? I just want to oh, go up. Oh yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I think it was down. So, so yeah. does, does it always assume that the uh, the offset between the two zones has to be just always like constant so that you can have that offset in each 
it, it does not assume anything you did not specify in your model specification. So here, that's a great question. Here, your model has race and age, but does not have any slope for. Uh, so basically, there's no division between the race and. Because we didn't specify one, we I could have. Yeah, I see. could have, and you know, and maybe we should have, right? So that's a different question, but we didn't specify one here, so it doesn't estimate one. It just assumes that there's different levels. Basically, computes the mean, the average weight of babies in the three categories. Okay, that's what's happening. Um, and if you also want to. Uh, model how that varies, say, with the mother's age, you could do that, but we haven't done that here. Yep. So, but did you get this point about this is sort of a, an important thing to remember? The point about how, you know, there's only two. We didn't talk about why there's only two, right? So we agreed with Courtney that, you know, you interpret these two in relation to the third one that's omitted. But why is it omitted? Why, why aren't there three? Couldn't there, couldn't there have been three? Sort of a half trick question. What's going on? You don't need another one. <laughs> I mean, it's a baseline variable, so it's not So the that's right. The point is, the third one is always perfectly determined by the other two in this case. Okay, because because if it's not race white, then if it's not race other, it must be the other one. It must be race black. Because you you know in this data set, you know, every row is exactly one race, you know one of these three possible values. Okay. So uh, having the other one in would basically be you know collinear with the first two. Because if you know the values on the first two, you absolutely know always the value of the third one. Okay? Because only one of them can be true at any point in time, right? You can't be race white and race other at the same time in this data set. Okay? That sense? So that's why, you know, so R figured this out okay? uh, and removed one. It arbitrarily chose black as the baseline why do you think it's so silly it's the first in the factor it's alphabetical okay it's alphabetical so i have in the slides uh which i uh i'm sharing with you i have some pointers for uh where do i have them Here, I have some pointers here, this part. Some pointers for how you might treat these categorical variables differently, you know, to compute different kinds of baselines and whatnot. Right? you could also, for example, uh, model this in a different way so as to compute uh, averages for each of the three categories as opposed to differences relative to a baseline category, you know, and, and other things like that. Uh, you can read more about this uh, on your own. I, point you to one place where you could do that. Okay, does it make sense? So those factors. Okay, good. So now let me go back and give you a few more examples. By the way, also, so I, I pointed you to all kinds of useful resources here. 
um, and to uh, lots of reading materials, including the ones that I've been using for these slides, but also a few other ones. All of these are in our shared folder with reading materials. So you'll have PDF versions of all of these so you can find them easily and, and read them uh, offline. Okay. Um, also, by the way, there's a really good course uh, offered in Heinz on sort of intro to data science using R, uh, where I've taken some of these examples from, and they have all kinds of online course materials also public. So you know, feel free to, to browse that or take the class if you have more bandwidth to, to do that too. Um, okay, so let me show you a few more examples. of so combining you know, continuous and categorical variables. This is much like the previous one. So here we have you know, some variable uh, x1 and outcome y uh, and some x2 category, much like uh, the previous example. Um, so we could have two models of this data. One is a simple linear model with no interaction. That would be the first one, the one on top. The second one would be one with an interaction term. Note this shorthand notation, the little star there. Uh, that's just shorthand for modeling both the uh, individual first order terms as well as their interaction. So just as a way, it's our syntax to save you, you know, a few keystrokes that automatically uh, estimates coefficients for all three of these. Okay, when you do that. Um, okay, so to your point earlier, the, uh, the model on the left, right, the one without an interaction term, okay, estimates a different intercept for each line, but they're all the same slope. Okay. Uh, the one on the right also varies the slope. Okay, that makes sense? So which one of these is better? given our data. I've color-coded the uh, observations corresponding to the four categories. The right one. The right one. Right. How would we know? How would we tell that? How can we tell which one's better? Uh, you know, other than by looking at this plot, how else could we tell? That's right, we look at the diagnostic plots. So this is the most useful of them all, probably, the uh, a plot of the residuals. So here you could see how in the, the top row is the first model, right? The simple linear model without the interaction term. The bottom row is the second model, the one with the interaction term. And you could see how for the green dots, which was whatever category this was, the second model is a much better fit. Okay. And in fact, the second model is a much better fit overall because these look you know, much closer to what you'd like to see, kind of this cloud of randomness, flat. Okay. Uh, three of the four in the topmost set of plots show some pattern, which is an indication of something bad going on. All right, here's another one. I'm gonna talk about diamonds for a second. Um, and we you have all of these observations uh, of the price that diamonds sold for as a function of various quality attributes. So here is the, uh, uh, on the x-axis, you have different kinds of cuts of diamonds uh, with fair, the leftmost one being the worst possible cut for diamonds uh, and uh, you know, it, it goes all the way to the ideal cut on the right-hand side. These are ordered by cut quality. Uh, and on the y-axis, you see the price of the diamond. Okay. So looking at this, you would roughly see what? Which diamonds are more expensive? What would you say based on this figure? 
premium? May, maybe premium, but in any case, right, may, maybe a little premium, a little bit premium. By the way, in, in these box plots, the uh, uh, solid lines in the middle are the median value. Um, and the box goes from the 25th to the 75th percentile, otherwise. Just so we know. So maybe medium, but in any case, it's somewhat flat. Okay, not not clear. Okay, so already surprising that you know, say fair diamonds sell for as much as the I don't know better cuts. Okay, here's another one. Here we're looking at uh, sort of imperfections, inclusions in the diamond itself. You know, um, and you have this I1 on the left-hand side uh, as the worst. It goes from that one to whatever this is, IF as the best. Um, and you know, the worst is when you can see them with the naked eye, and the best is when maybe they aren't there or you need some sort of you know, magnifier to see them, if at all. What do you see here? Which diamonds are more expensive? It looks a little like the, the worst diamonds are more expensive than the better ones. Again, right? Isn't that weird? Here's another one. This is color. You don't want them to show any color. So here, your J is slightly yellow color. That's the worst. That's the rightmost one. Uh, D is, I guess, the I don't know, no color. So again, you see that the worse the color, the more it sells for. Okay, so I've shown you three plots. Oops, I've shown you three plots. I don't have a them side by side. Uh, kind of pointing to the same conclusion that worse diamonds are more expensive. How does that make any sense? Because the perfect diamonds can only be synthesized from the average. No, but it can't. It can't possibly. No. That's actually also my idea. Yeah, I, I think that's. Well, say that again. So basically, the like, many there are manufactured diamonds. Sure. Which are synthesized from that, and like the quality are actually better than those diamonds from like, you know, like. Okay, sure. agreed. But let's say let's say these are all natural. For the sake of I I don't know. For the sake of argument, let's say they're all natural, so they're also the same source. What's going on? Maybe we're all. I'm assuming maybe before this, I maybe would have assumed that like these three factors can co-occur. Like the best diamond has all of these things. But maybe there's some physical properties that means that there's more complicated physical relationships between all of these parameters. So there's some, uh -huh. and so, price is somewhat of a subjective measure. So maybe there's like complicated interactions between these attributes and it leads to different subjective understandings of value. Cool. That's a good hypothesis. Mm -hmm. I like that. Uh, but no, I, I like it though. Well, what else? Maybe it's that the like if you know enough about diamonds to be able to design for quality, you also are much more knowledgeable about what a fair price would be. So it's easier to sell in greater inflated price. It, it, the, the best way to make the most money is to take a very cheap diamond and sell it at an inflated price to someone who isn't able to do it without any. Yeah, you you've been watching like you know people flipping houses or something too much on tv i guess <laughs> that's also a good it's a good theory it's a good hypothesis but you're all overthinking it and there are points of time, more points of time. also no M much simpler explanation you're overthinking it much much simpler explanation There's more cheaper. You'll laugh. It's so silly. You'll laugh. I promise. You know what it is? They're just bigger. Uh, we never talked about this. 
as it turns out that the biggest predictor, the best predictor of price for diamonds is size. Okay, if it's a huge thing that goes, you know, in the uh, you know, crown jewels in England, uh, it's probably really expensive. If it's teeny tiny, it's probably relatively inexpensive. Okay, so sure, like all of these quality attributes matter. Okay, but the point is, you know, the, the trick that's happening here is um, all, all of the, this, you know, relationships, re, all of these relationships between these quality attributes and price are obscured by size. Because it's going to be the smaller diamonds that are better in quality and the larger ones that are worse on average. Yes. Is it not misleading to show all those previous graphs and have them not be controlled for size? Isn't, yes. Isn't that the point of this class is to, you know, develop a healthy dose of skepticism so that when presented, say, on the news or whatever, with, you know, similar plots to the ones before on different topics, you know, you'll be like, yeah, but what about size? You know, what about this huge confounding factor? You know, have you accounted for that in some way in your analysis or are you tricking me? That's the point. I am trying to, to, you know, grow this sense of skepticism in you all so that you can question these claims that you see people like me making in the previous slides and others in general. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. oh yeah, sorry. I just feel like that is so wrong. Like, if someone tried to publish those previous graphs, I feel like they should be banned from ever doing research. <laughs> <laughs> like, legitimately though. Yeah, sorry, I'm just, I'm a very visceral reaction to that. You said it first. You would be surprised. You would be surprised how bad uh, papers that try to get published and actually end up getting, you'd be surprised how bad the ones that get rejected are, but um, still surprised to see that lots of published papers are also often bad, a bad science in them. Because it's hard to do science well, it's hard, it's just hard. It's like it takes a lot of training and practice and all that, it's hard. Okay? And we're publishing way too much and way too frequently and it's just hard to control quality at this rate. Yeah, which is why we need to, you know, train ourselves better to recognize these mistakes and avoid them when we're doing science and, you know, help others avoid them too when we see them doing them. Do you know about the three-legged cat? Huh? This is when we talk about in design. Um, if say you run an animal shelter, the cats that have the shortest stay in the animal shelter are three-legged cats because people see them and they're like, oh, I really feel for this cat. I want to take this cat home. And so if you're like doing decontextualized research about like, how do we get animals adopted at higher rates? Like you could lead to the conclusion like, oh, we need to like cut those legs off for cats. <laughs> Basically, so like sometimes we say that as a like test in research, you're like, oh, is this a three-legged cat situation? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I like that. <laughs> There's this other uh, famous image of uh, an airplane uh, and like uh, different bullet holes. And it's sort of showing, have you seen it? You've probably seen this. I don't have it right now, so I'll have to look for it. Maybe somebody can find it and post it in the Slack channel in the meantime. Um, so it shows you survivor bias, right? It shows you that, you know, uh, you know, basically all the planes that have survived, right, that were still, you know, ended up flying and ended up, you know, landing or whatever that could be observed, you know, had uh, bullet holes in these places that were not essential. And you know, all the other planes that you've never observed in the first place got shut because they got shut down. You know, they, they had bullet holes elsewhere, right? So it's another one of those. Uh, but yeah, it's hard to do science, Eli. It's hard. No, yeah, I'm sorry. You, you convinced me. I'm just... I'm worried that people actually do that. So I think, and I think even if you don't assume that they're doing this maliciously, which is what, you know, I, I, I do this, I assume they're not doing this maliciously. Uh, so naive, hopeless, optimist like that. Even then, right, you know, 
these are so subtle and so hard. It's like these are the most trivial things, and we already, you know, they already catch us by surprise. Like imagine when you get into something a little bit more sophisticated and complex. It's really hard to get it right. It's very easy to make mistakes, even when you're not trying to, and when you're, you know, well trained and whatnot. It's just hard to do this. Okay. Um, right. So one thing I've done here is uh, I have uh, removed the strong association with weight by uh, you know, basically. Uh, so here, I'm going to redo all of the previous plots we've seen, uh, not on uh, price itself as the outcome, but on the residuals of price when modeled as a function of weight. So whatever weight cannot explain, okay, I'm keeping those residuals, and I'm re-showing, re-plotting the previous things that you've seen before, and you can see very clearly now that you know the patterns you would expect, right? That's the worse the cut, the cheaper the price. The more imperfections, the cheaper the diamond. Uh, the worse the color, the cheaper the diamond. So all the things that you'd expect, right? Intuitively, you now begin to see once we take size out of the equation, once we control for that. Okay. So this was the the trick here. Okay, and oh yeah, um, diagnostic plot would have helped you uh, identify that something was going wrong here, which is why we applied this log transform to get rid of this. What did we call this? We used the complicated unpronounceable word to describe the situation on the left-hand side. Does anybody remember what that was? Heteroscedasticity. Okay, now try pronouncing that three times in a row. <laughs> After some Halloween party or something. <laughs> so you've had a beverage. Um, okay, so we talked about this. All right, final example, I think, on this deck of slides. Here we're looking, uh, so it's date on the x-axis, the number of flights living New York City per day on the y-axis. What do you see? Louder. Yeah, it looks so you see this really jagged spiky pattern, right? So it looks like, you know, there's some days in the week when there's a lot fewer flights, right? So consistently, regardless of, you know, what date we're, uh, what time of the year we're looking at, consistently some days of the week when there's fewer flights. And that is true, as it turns out, they have way fewer flights on the weekends, Saturday especially. So this is the same data broken down by weekday. And you could see how you know, the distribution of flights per day on Saturdays, which is this thing on the right-hand side, is way lower than all the other ones. Sunday, which is the first one there on the left-hand side, is also a little lower than the, the weekdays. Okay, which makes sense, you know, there's not so much work travel, business travel on the weekends, right? there's fewer flights, more flights during the week. That right? makes sense. Okay. Um, so if we were to model this, okay, so you know, let's say we wanna model this day of week effect. So here I built a simple linear model. Uh, I'm modeling the number of flights as a function of the weekday. So basically, I'm doing what? I'm estimating what? How do you interpret this? Very simple model here. Linear model flights as a function of 
weekday, one of seven possible values. How do I interpret this? What does it give me? Not a trick question. Somebody over Zoom for a change. Somebody in the room. Anybody? What am I getting? How do I interpret a model like this? If I were to model just you know number of flights as a function of the weekday, which is a category, what would that estimate? Yes, it's as simple as that. It's just the mean. It's the mean number of flights per day over the seven days. It's, it's that simple. That's what the model does. It estimates the mean for each of the values of this categorical variable. Okay. Um, so I've done that, and I'm showing you the residuals here, whatever's left, whatever's not explained by weekday. Okay. Uh, so you can see how, you know, uh, Maybe in the you know the beginning, the earlier half of this time series, you see that we're somewhat closer to zero, meaning the error is small. We're fitting pretty well, and as we get more to the right of this time series, we're seeing you know more and more of these extreme uh, spikes again. Like it seems like the model is doing uh, increasingly worse uh, as we uh, move away from the beginning of the time series. What is happening? Matt? It's like holidays. Looks like holidays. How so? Um, yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep, do you see this? All of these, maybe? Plausible. Yeah. Um, right, so that's true here. You can see this broken down by day of the week, uh, you know, further broken down by day of the week. So you can see how, you know, you can see these errors, especially happening on the weekends relative to, to weekdays. Um, so what's happening is that, you know, the model is failing to accurately predict the number of flights on say Saturday uh, around holidays like Matt saw. So one way to account for this would be to say create some term or dummy variable, uh, spring, summer, and fall, for example. Or you could create you know holiday specific dummy variables. It doesn't really matter. So it's one way we're introducing a variable here to account for you know when in the year we are uh, at. Okay, makes sense. Uh, and doing this uh, here, you know, you see two models. The first model is the original we looked at, number of flights as a function of weekday. The second model has this extra term dummy variable in it and has an interaction with weekdays. So, you know, maybe the term changes the magnitude of the relationship between Saturday uh, and the number of flights, okay, if there is one. Okay. I'm estimating these two, uh, and you can see uh, overlaid there the residuals from these two models. The red one is the one that has the term, uh, term, term, term in it. Bad choice of name there. Uh, the green one is the one that does not have the term, term in it. Uh, and you can hopefully see that uh, there's less error when you add in this you know, extra term model. Okay. So by the way, just as an aside, all of this is exploratory, right? So that, you know, given a data set, we're trying to come up with a good model. Like all of these few examples I've shown you lately were that, right? To start from some empirical observations and you're trying to, find a good model that explains them, that captures them. 
typically we do it the other way around to just keep that in mind typically you know you start from some theory you have some hypotheses for which you deliberately collect the right data you need and you use you know a model to test those hypotheses that you've come up with you know before ahead of time rather than to do this in an exploratory fashion right you here we're basically creating hypotheses right rather than testing them right we're hypothesizing that you know the holidays make a difference right we're discovering these hypotheses by exploring the data using this uh, regression framework you could do that too okay? but just you know note that distinction right that here this is has been an exploratory analysis over the last few examples most often when you're doing this with regression it's going to be a a confirmatory type analysis you have the hypotheses already and you're testing them so you you might already have a hypothesis about holidays right affecting the number of flights and you model that from from the beginning you don't discover that by accident or something but you start from that hypothesis you include it explicitly in your model from the beginning okay but just keep that in mind okay um okay so now enough of this i want to go back to uh let's see let's talk about standardized coefficients any questions or thoughts okay then next up yes yeah, it's gonna be fun so here we have a uh Salary data, how much money people make. And we have various uh, measures for these different people in our data set. We have some measure of their intelligence. I don't know how we've computed this. We have some me uh, measure of their knowledge, uh, job specific knowledge, how you know, knowledgeable are they for the role they're uh, in, how many years of education they've had, how many years of professional experience they've had, and their tenure on the job, how long they've been uh, on, on that job, okay? Um, okay, very good. So here's a model of earnings as a, linear combination of all of these things. Okay. Uh, and here is the uh, summary of that estimated model. Okay. What do we see? Can somebody briefly summarize this for me? How do I interpret this? You don't have to be very specific, but at a, high, at a high level, how do I interpret this? Eli. In, in decreasing order of importance, like the um, variables that have the most impact on someone's earnings are years of education, then years of experience, and then knowledge and engineering. So. Good. Yeah. Do we roughly agree with this? Does anybody disagree with this? The range is. I'm going to come back to this in a second. You're right. I'm going to come back to this in a second. It's going to come back to bite you. Science is hard. Because these are uh, all measured on different uh, scales, they have different range, each of these. Some of them have different units, even. Right? So, you know. Your IQ test score is on whatever you know scale. Your years of experience are on, are on a different scale. So there's just the different units, plus different ranges, even if they're the same units, right? So you know years of education probably has a very narrow range. You know everybody has at least some education, and you know everybody stops you know at some point with their education. So there's only a you know kind of narrow range for that. Years of experience is a much wider range, right? You could have, you know, anywhere between zero and lots of experience, presumably. Okay, so even when they're measured in the same unit, they're still on different, they still have different ranges. Okay, and this is gonna come back and, and bite us. 
Uh, number of neurons, yes, uh, Sam is right. Yeah, yeah. that's the IQ uh, unit, how many neurons you have. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, and I guess otherwise, uh, you know, looking at this, right? I, one thing I would notice is that all of these est coefficient estimates are statistically significant. So, you know, there, there's some association between each of these variables and the outcome. Um, that's one thing I would observe, right? Before thinking too deeply about this. The other thing I would observe is that all of these coefficients are positive, right? Which means that, you know, the more, you know, whatever you have, the more money you make, right? On average. The more knowledge you have, the more money you make, the more experience you have, the more money you make, et cetera. The more neurons you have, the more money you make, right? So that's another you know, high level thing that you would immediately conclude from this, okay? So now let's go back to the gotcha that we just talked about. So let's say, oh yeah, so your residual source is fitted, looks okay, you know, you're pretty happy with this. Uh, if you look at more of these, you know, the QQ, not great, but it's also not the worst. Uh, this shows a little bit of pattern, again, not the worst. So these mostly look okay. So you're not too unhappy with the model overall. That's fine. Um, that's a histogram of the response. Okay, so now suppose, this is exactly the question we we're talking about. Suppose you're asking this question, you know, which has more impact on earnings? Is it an additional year of experience in your field? as measured by this years of experience variable, or is it an additional year of education as measured by, or sorry, or an additional year, or additional year of experience at your current employer, uh, which is the tenure variable? Is it experience in the field in general or experience in the company in particular? Which of these is more valuable, gives you a higher return on earnings? Okay, and you would think, you know, they're both measured in, in years, Right, so it makes sense to compare them directly. Um, and you know, we argued that they have different ranges just a minute ago. Uh, let's see. Yeah. You know, you could look at the range. You can confirm that they're different ranges, even if they're the same unit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay. So if you actually, let me zoom back to this a little bit. Uh, back to the first model summary we we had here. So years of these last two, years of experience versus tenure is what we were asking, right? So if you look at this, you conclude that experience is worth more, right? Experience in the field is worth more than tenure at the company, right? That was the interpretation. Would it be more accurate to say like one extra unit of years experience relative to the range of years experience. That's right. So that's what we're going to do. Um, but to hold this, hold this conclusion, preliminary conclusion in mind, right? The first conclusion we had is that experience is worth more than tenure. Maybe about twice as much if you just look at these coefficients. Okay, that was our first interpretation of this. Okay, so now let's say we do what Eli suggested um, and we are instead going to scale, rescale these variables. What I've done is I have rescaled them to have mean zero and standard deviation one. This is also called a z-score, by the way. So it's a common transform. You've heard it by that name, maybe. Okay, so I've done that with, with both of them. Okay, so now the interpretation changes. Okay? These coefficient estimates are not going to be one unit increase in, say, education gives me that beta coefficient estimate unit increase in the response. It's not gonna be that anymore. It's going to be one standard deviation increase in the variable gives me that beta increase in the response. Okay, so we're not talking about absolute units anymore, but standard deviations. Okay, that's how this changes. And maybe that's a fairer thing to do. Okay, like you were saying. 
Okay, so if I look at this, I would see what? Right, so before we were about two to one, remember? We said, you know, the original conclusion was years of experience, it was about two to one relative to tenure. Right now, it's about 10 to one, but not quite, nine to one. Okay. Very different interpretation of this. You could also look at this, the other two. You could look at education versus experience. Okay, education two to one relative to experience. We go back to the original. Education five to one to experience. Okay. Very different conclusions from these versions of the model. So the trick is, you know, it's maybe a fair uh, interpretation to reason about the standardized coefficients rather than the, you know, the, the raw ones. And that's the idea. Okay, so reasoning about, you know, uh, standard deviation increases in these variables rather than absolute unit increases in these variables because they just might not be as meaningful, the absolute unit increases. That makes sense? So that's a common thing that happens by standardizing your coefficients and basically you know, transforming the interpretation of your model into standard deviations rather than absolute units. Okay. Uh, ooh, we're running low on time, darn. I wanted to show you Another thing, but let's see. Um, about this. Okay, yeah, maybe I can show you this a little bit. Uh, no, I want to show you. Yeah, let me show you this a little bit. Uh, I'll, I'll get this started. This is typing speed. Maybe we talked about this earlier too, I don't remember. Typing speed on the X axis on a keyboard versus how many errors you make on the Y axis. Okay. And each point is an observation. I think I have maybe five people in the study uh, and each person typed, uh, I don't know, a, a bunch of documents or something. And that's where the data comes from. What's the conclusion? How do I interpret this? What's the relationship between typing speed and accuracy or errors? That's all the information I'm giving you. How do you, if this is all I'm telling you, how do you read this? The faster you type, the fewer errors, the less errors you make. Weird, isn't it? I was gonna suggest rejecting the paper, <laughs> the prompt and the graph. I think, so not, I think we can just say, when someone types faster, they also make fewer errors. How is that possible? And that's less, it's less misleading than the other way of saying it. Yeah, but still, how is that possible? Because we are experts. See, so we're, we're getting somewhere. It's another one of those diamond tricks. So what if I were to now actually show you where the data came from? 
I told you that there were five people in the study. I'm going to show you the five people. Uh, oh yeah, so the model looks good. You're happy with it, whatever. Uh, that's all there. There it is. This is the same data, except I'm showing you now separately uh, the five uh -huh. the five people that took part in the study. Definitely say they were clear clusters there. They were. I could have done a better job at hiding. What do you see now? It's the opposite. Can somebody read this for me? Yeah, Matt. The more you, the faster you type, the more errors you make. That's true of everybody. Right? The faster you type, the more errors you make. But at the same time, what? on average make less errors yeah people who type faster on average they're maybe better at typing they, they make fewer errors okay so you can see this you know very clearly opposing within group pattern and between group patterns okay? within group if you look at each person individually it's true that for every person the faster they type the more errors they make but between groups, it appears that it's the opposite, that the faster you type, the fewer errors you make. Okay. And so I'm going to show you how we model this. And too bad Hongbo is not here anymore, is he? Not. Because uh, we're going to use mixed effects models, which are his least favorite. Uh, but I'm going to show you that on Thursday. Uh, and maybe, so again, coming back to the ask, there are uh, three papers that I would like you to, well, I don't know where I put it. Did I just close it? Uh, three papers that I would like you to sign up for, uh, and we might present them on Thursday. There we go. So yeah, please, uh, oh, Courtney signed up for one already. Thanks, Courtney. So two papers have not yet been taken. So if you feel so inclined, especially if you haven't presented yet, please sign up for one of these and we will do them on Thursday. Okay. And again, as before, you know, so these all use regression modeling, multiple regression, focus on that part. And, you know, I mean, tell us what the questions are and whatnot, what hypotheses they're testing, but really pay lots of attention to how they're doing the modeling uh, because these are sort of examples of how to do the modeling. Okay, so let me end here. I'll take more questions and complaints about how science is hard, and I'm a trickster um, in the meantime. Thanks.